Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. You might have seen headlines recently, maybe even from The Economist itself, declaring that China's universities are now, well, according to a prestigious index, the best in the world. That's quite a bold claim, isn't it? It really is. Especially when you see the 2025 Nature Index notes that um, a surprising eight of the global top 10 research institutions are now Chinese. For you, someone who follows these global shifts, this is a claim that really demands a closer look. So what exactly does this mean? And you know, how should we truly interpret such a significant shift in the global research landscape? It's a fascinating question, absolutely. And one that really requires us to um, peel back the layers a bit. Yeah. Because while the sheer numbers on the surface are undeniably impressive, understanding what truly goes into those rankings and critically what they might not be measuring, well, that's absolutely crucial for any real insight. Today, we're going to try and unpack the specifics for you, maybe challenge some assumptions, and put all of this into its proper context. Okay, right. Let's start with what The Economist article highlights. Because, you know, on its face, it points to a genuine, pretty rapid improvement in China's research capabilities. Over the past decade, their spending on research and development has shot up by roughly 9% annually in real terms. Mm -hmm. That's huge. That's a phenomenal rate, isn't it? Mm. And in 2023, if you adjust for purchasing power, China actually outspent both America and the European Union on combined government and higher ed R&D. We're talking colossal investment here. Colossal is the word. And they've even managed to draw back many Chinese researchers who were once working abroad, the uh, so-called hegili or sea turtles. That's a significant talent influx for them. And this sustained massive investment, well, you see, it has indeed paid off in some very tangible ways, no question. When you look at just the raw output and um, the impact in specific domains, China now publishes more high impact papers than either America or Europe. High impact meaning? Meaning those in the most highly cited 1%. So these are the papers that other researchers worldwide are really building upon, the foundational stuff in certain fields. They're considered world leaders now in areas like chemistry, engineering, material science. Right. We see examples of this success, like Zhejiang University uh, ranked fourth in that 2025 index. It was the alma mater of Liang Wenfeng, you know, the founder of DeepSeek, a cutting edge AI company. So the volume and that perceived impact, it's certainly there particularly in these specific high growth areas. Okay, so on one hand, we have this undeniable surge, the investment, the output, it's clear. But what exactly is the nature index measuring? How are these, frankly, startling rankings actually created? What's the method? Yeah, that's a really critical question because the nature index, it has a very specific and frankly narrow scope. It counts contributions from researchers, right, at different institutions to papers published across a set of just 145 journals. They call them elite journals. Only 145. Just 145. And critically, these are natural sciences only which means it explicitly excludes huge chunks of academia, social sciences, many important health journals, computer science conference proceedings, uh, all the humanities. Gone. Wow. Okay. So this narrow focus, it immediately shapes the league table. It means it's not by any stretch a comprehensive measure of all academic research. It's measuring a very, very particular slice of the scientific pie. So if it's just natural sciences, how does that narrow scope and maybe even the specific mix of disciplines within those sciences, how does that actually shape what we end up seeing in the rankings? Right, because that discipline mix comes into play too. And it's another key factor that, well, it inherently skews the results. You see, a growing number of publications in chemistry and physical science journals means their share has increased. It's now just over half of all the journals used in the 2025 index. Over half, just chemistry and physical sciences. It's just over half which heavily overweights areas where Chinese output is particularly strong and has seen, you know, really rapid growth. Conversely, papers from health and biological science journals, an area where Western institutions have historically dominated and frankly still excel, they account for only about 20% of the index. Only 20% for health and bio? Just 20%. So this structural bias, it's baked into the index's design and it significantly impacts the results if you're trying to understand overall broad excellence across a whole university. And what about the counting? How do they count contributions if you've got multiple institutions on a paper or maybe one massive institution involved? Does that affect things? Oh, absolutely. The counting method gives fractional credit, right, for every co-author's institution. Yeah. Now, that might seem fair on the surface, but it inadvertently favors these mega institutions like the Chinese Academy of Sciences, 
You know, CAS, right? That's not just one university, is it? Not at all. CAS is this vast, sprawling network, tens of thousands of staff across hundreds of different subsidiaries and institutes. Its sheer scale just allows it to contribute to an enormous number of papers, often across multiple research units within its structure. CAS was already number one back in the 2016 index, and it remains this dominant force, largely because of that immense scale and its collaborative reach. It's almost like an entire research ecosystem in it itself. Okay. So putting all this together then, the narrow focus on specific natural sciences, the uh, overweighting of certain disciplines like chemistry, and this counting method favoring mega institutions. Mm. It really sounds like the Nature Index is primarily measuring a very specific kind of publication-based volume in certain lab sciences. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a holistic yardstick of best universities overall like that headline might make you think. Mm -hmm. It seems more like it's measuring a targeted scientific might, maybe rather than broad academic supremacy. You've absolutely hit on the core insight there. That's exactly right. It's an incredibly important metric, don't get me wrong, for understanding specific scientific output in those chosen fields. Right. And it reflects real significant advances. But it's just far from the whole story when we talk about what makes a university best in the world. Right. So given these very specific parameters of the Nature Index, what happens when we sort of cross-check China's performance against other indicators, other metrics. Mm. Do we see the same consistent dominance across the board, or does the picture maybe start to get a bit more nuanced? That's precisely where the narrative becomes much more complex, much yeah. more nuanced, because while China does show a rising impact in some areas, like for instance, leading in those top 1% cited papers, according to misstep data, I think it's China at 27% versus the US at 25%. Okay. Other major global rankings tell a very, very different story. Yeah. The idea of universal dominance, it just isn't really that clear cut when you look broader. You mean rankings like um, the QS World University Rank yeah. or Times Higher Education? Those mm -hmm. are usually the big global ones people think of, aren't they? The comprehensive yes, ones. Exactly those. When you look at the 2025 QS World University Rank, for instance, Tsinghua is number 17, Peking University is 25. 17 and 25. Right. Only two mainland Chinese schools even managed to break into the top 20. Now, compare that to MIT at number one, Stanford at number two. Big difference. Huge difference. And similarly, in the Times Higher Education rank, Tsinghua is 12, Peking is 13. No Chinese entry in the top 10 at all. That's where you find the stalwarts, like Oxford at number one, Harvard at number two. Mm. So it immediately shows that a different kind of strength, maybe a broader set of criteria, is being measured by these other rankings. So even though the R&D spend is truly impressive, China, as of 2023, edging out the U.S. by about 5% on those combined government and higher ed budgets, yep. that sheer volume of investment doesn't automatically translate to the top spots across all comprehensive university rankings. It seems like the investment pays off in some metrics, but maybe not others. That's a really crucial observation. Volume doesn't just automatically equate to holistic quality or you know overall excellence, especially when you start to consider other critical factors beyond just counting publications, which brings up an important, maybe uncomfortable question. What about the reproducibility and the integrity of all this research? Is the enormous volume matched by reliability? That's a really crucial point. Are there actually figures on that, on retractions, data integrity issues in the published papers? Unfortunately, yes, there are. And they are pretty stark. When you hear that China accounted for a staggering 54%, 54% of global retractions in 2022. Half. Over half. Largely driven by issues like image manipulation, data manipulation, it's not just a statistic. It really reveals a potential crack in the very foundation of scientific trust. Over half of all papers pulled worldwide for integrity issues coming from one country. Yeah. It raises profound questions about the reliability of the knowledge being produced, especially given the sheer volume we're seeing. The overall retraction rate in China from 2020 to 22 was about 26 retractions per 10,000 papers. That's four times the world average. Four times. It's four times. So this isn't just an integrity concern. It suggests maybe a systemic pressure, perhaps mm. a publish or perish culture that might have some deeply unintended consequences for the trustworthiness of the science itself. That is incredibly sobering. And it makes me wonder then, what about the broader academic environment? Does it really foster the kind of free inquiry, the open intellectual exchange that, well, many believe is absolutely essential for truly breakthrough research? Yeah, and this is where we kind of move beyond the numbers and look at the underlying conditions, the climate. 
Imagine trying to do research where challenging conventional wisdom or maybe even exploring certain politically sensitive topics is actively discouraged. Recent reports coming out of China highlight this tightened political control that um, limits topics and actively discourages open debate within Chinese academia. Now, this isn't just some abstract concept of academic freedom. Many would argue it's the very oxygen needed for truly transformative paradigm shifting research. If ideas can't be freely tested, debated, if certain lines of inquiry are effectively off limits, where do the next really big breakthroughs, the Nobel level stuff, come from? Right. Because groundbreaking innovation often springs from challenging established ideas, doesn't it? Yeah. Pursuing controversial lines of inquiry, mm. which could be really constrained in that kind of environment. Exactly. It can be significantly constrained. So, okay, if that's the research climate and we're seeing this massive output, mm. does it actually translate into groundbreaking patents, things that really shake up industries globally? Right. Looking again at that innovation pipeline, do the Chinese filings lead to the most cited, truly disruptive innovations? Or is it more about, say, building incrementally on existing ideas? Well, studies looking at patent quality from 2025, they indicate that while China's output is indeed very high volume wise, mm -hmm. their patents tend to be, and I quote, narrower and less innovative over time. Now, that's still valuable, right, for incremental industrial application, efficient development. But it seems it's still U.S., European and Japanese patents that dominate the most cited tier. Those often represent the more foundational breakthroughs. So it suggests maybe a, a strong focus on applied science and engineering that builds very efficiently, rather than perhaps the blue sky research that fundamentally shifts paradigms. Okay. It's a different kind of innovation, maybe, with a different kind of impact. So we've clearly established that excellence here is pretty field specific. It's not a blanket statement covering everything. And these mixed signals certainly suggest that. It doesn't negate China's scientific gains. Those are real or impressive in many areas. Absolutely. But it certainly tempers the idea that its universities now just universally set the global gold standard. You've encapsulated it perfectly there. The nature index is a valuable measure. It shows immense progress, no doubt. But other composite measures like QS, VHE, ARWU, they still rank Western universities ahead on broader criteria, things like teaching quality, international collaboration, overall citation impact outside those specific hard sciences. It fundamentally comes down to which lens you choose to view this really complex landscape through. And there's that really crucial challenge we touched on, quantity versus reproducibility. Quality. Yes. China leads in article counts, overall citations in certain fields, sure. Yeah. But also, troublingly, in retractions and plagiarism cases. It really feels like volume alone can sometimes mask fragile quality controls. That's an absolutely crucial distinction to make. Then there's the discipline imbalance we talked about earlier. Chemistry, material science, they are unequivocally driving China's rise in these rankings, yeah. and they excel there. But other fields like biomedicine, economics, humanities fields, often critical for Nobel level breakthroughs or maybe broader societal impact, they remain overwhelmingly dominated by institutions in the US, the UK, Europe. The global scientific landscape isn't monolithic, you know, it's more like a mosaic of different strengths. And what role does the funding itself play in driving this? Is it simply about pouring money into the system? Does that explain uh, everything? Well, the massive state investment, the talent recall programs like Hegui we mentioned, even things like citation-based bonus schemes for researchers. Mm -hmm. They certainly propel publication work, that's clear. However, those very incentives, while effective for driving volume, can inadvertently foster what's sometimes called publish or perish distortions. Right. When the reward structure is so heavily tied to just sheer publication volume, it can create immense pressure. And that pressure might, at times, compromise rigorous peer review or ethical conduct. It can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Okay, so we're moving towards a more nuanced verdict here. What's the bottom line for you? How should we really frame this discussion about China's academic standing for you, our listener, trying to make sense of these headlines? I think the bottom line is this. China's top research universities are now, without a doubt, world class in several specific laboratory sciences, and they benefit from colossal sustained funding. That's undeniable. However, calling them the best in the world overall. That depends entirely on your yardstick. It depends on the specific criteria you value most. It's simply not a simple universal truth. So maybe to put it simply for you, our listener, if what you care most about is cutting edge chemistry or engineering or material science, you might absolutely look to Tsinghua or CAS or Zhejiang University as genuine global leaders. Absolutely. But if your focus is more on, say, 
highly reproducible biomedicine or foundational breakthroughs, maybe even Nobel Prize pedigree, then institutions like Harvard, Oxford, Stanford might still be your primary leaders in those areas. Precisely. And if you value things like academic freedom, broad cross-disciplinary thinking, the cultivation of truly disruptive ideas, well, institutions like MIT, Cambridge, maybe ETH Zurich might still be considered ahead on those fronts. For raw R&D output volume, yes, China as a whole leads, but each institution, each nation, really has its unique strengths, its particular focus, and its own set of challenges, too. So that headline statistic from the Nature Index, it's undoubtedly impressive, it's significant, we shouldn't dismiss it. Not at all. But as we've explored, it's just insufficient on its own to crown China's universities as the definitive global benchmark across the board. Excellence, as we've discussed, it's really multidimensional, isn't it? And it critically depends on what aspects of best you're actually trying to measure. Exactly right. And the story of China's immense rise in research, it's complex, it's fascinating. It really prompts us to consider, well, what truly defines a world-class university today? In this era of unprecedented global information flow and scientific collaboration, and maybe more importantly, how do we as a global scientific community ensure that the intense pursuit of quantity doesn't inadvertently overshadow those foundational values of integrity, of open inquiry, and of genuinely disruptive thought? Definitely food for thought there. Thank you for joining us for this analysis. We really hope this has given you a more comprehensive, maybe more nuanced understanding of what's happening in global academia helping you navigate those headlines with a clearer, more informed perspective.